Hello, I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Rain Podcast. Today in our studio via Zoom, uh, we are interviewing uh, Raymond Gibby, who is a fantastic sculptor extraordinaire, uh, pretty much graces our Durango Gallery uh, only. Um, but I want to get him, I want to introduce him to you and let him um, explain a little bit about where he's come from and his art journey. Uh, we'll get to know him a little better. Well, welcome, Raymond. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I was uh, reading a little bit on your biography that we have there. There's just a couple of sheets we printed from your website there. Um, so you were raised in, in uh, California. Is that where you were born? Yeah, outside of Riverside, kind of up in the hill country area out there. Yeah. Um, and uh, something else I read about was that your uh, grandfather was a, a painter as well. Yeah, he was a very quiet type of man. He uh, graduated from uh, Brigham Young University with a bachelor's in fine arts, uh, but never uh, took it to a professional level. We just were always supplied with lots of oil paintings from him. <laughs> so, That's like my mom. Mom's a yeah, painting. It kind of skewed my uh, my um, understanding of how to price paintings <laughs> yeah. since we always got free ones, so. Right. <laughs> so um, tell me how you got uh, started in art. What was your inspiration, your influence, things of that nature? Well, obviously, my my uh, grandfather, um, when he'd come and visit us, he'd always bring an oil painting of some landscape that he had done, old landscape or a barn or or something like that from, from uh, you know, the Utah uh, area. Um, so I always wanted to be like him and he, he was the one that taught me how to go fishing and things like that. And so I wanted to be like him. So from a young age, that was an interest for me. Um, and go, growing up all through uh, school and so forth, the thing that I kind of found made me unique and made me a little bit cool because normally I was not a cool kid. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the, what I thought made me kind of cool was uh, during art class, uh, even the popular kids were you know, would give me attention because <laughs> uh, they could they kind of surround and surround my desk and see what I was doing. So uh, I always wanted to be an artist because it was how I was able to connect with uh, people from different uh, uh, groups, so to speak. Um, and that's always been the case. You know, I, I can kind of transcend different uh, um, uh, social groups because of my art. And that uh, that kind of always made me, uh, you know, very happy that I could do that. So. Uh, but I didn't think I could become a professional artist uh, until uh, my senior year in high school, where I met a woman named Judy Erickson, who had recently been attacked by a man uh, with a post hole digger, of wow. all things. And uh, she severed her arm. She had her arm severed. She was a professional artist, but she couldn't do any more artwork. And um, so I, I met her. She was uh, about four, four doors down from me on my street. And, um, we, we, uh, connected and she, I found out later she was contemplating, uh, suicide because she had felt like she had lost her love in her life. And, um, and, uh, little did I know, I just found a mentor, you know, someone that could teach me, uh, you know, what it was like to be a professional artist. And she gave me hope that I could be. And in that way, we kind of saved each other, you know, and it was kind of a neat thing. Uh, she's the one that taught me uh, two dimensional, um, you know, how to how to uh, sell artwork, uh, the professional side of, of doing art, uh, where my grandfather was a great influence on teaching me composition and color and so forth. But she's the one that introduced me to printers and uh, introduced me to uh, doing shows and, and uh, things of that of that nature. Um, when I got a little older, she introduced me to a company that uh, did commercial sculpting for uh, sipper drink companies. Or, I'm sorry, for uh, it was a sipper drink company. So I, I would actually sculpt little um, uh, figurines that turned that they turned into blow molds for amusement parks like SeaWorld and Knott's Berry Farm and and places like that out in California. Um, my, my claim to fame is that I actually sculpted a Woodstock that Charles Schultz had to approve before no, he died. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's kind of how I got started in, in the sculpting world. And it was because Judy had introduced me to, uh, to that, uh, you know, three, three dimensional, 
Uh, so she, was, uh, uh, she was a sculptor, not a painter. She yeah. was, she was Early. actually, she was a uh, painter. Uh, she, she was kind of like me where we can trans, you know, go, go through uh, lots of different. Yeah. Um, a lot of artists, uh, I think tend to be very focused on their, their, uh, favorite medium and so forth. But, uh, she, she and I were kind of the same in that we could transcend different mediums and, and, uh, two dimensional, three dimensional, whichever. Yeah. So, uh, when that opportunity came up, I got my first, uh, commercial sculpting job from her. So, Oh, that is a wonderful story. Yeah. Uh, she, she kind of led me into it. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the influence of like what you're doing now in, in, uh, bronze, uh, why animal forms? So my first, uh, besides the, uh, sculpting, uh, the, uh, sculptures for the amusement parks, my first bronze introduction was when I got a job in 2001 at an art foundry in uh, Springville, Utah. Mm. And, um, that was right before nine 11. And as you know, in nine 11, the art market tanked really hard. You know, the, the country had just been changed and the economy, uh, shot down the toilet. And, um, so what I got from that was an education on what kind of artwork and at what level of, of, uh, quality an art, an artist would need to be able to maintain in order to be able to continue through a, a terrible tragedy like that and, and, and continue in a career. Mm -hmm. I saw, I saw before nine 11, a, a ton of artwork being sold and created. And I, it gave me hope that, Hey, if this is stuff that uh, is selling, <laughs> maybe I'm good enough to be able to do the same thing. And, and, uh, and I approached my father-in-law and uh, he gave me my first uh, seed money to make my first bronze. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but what I saw from that whole experience is how all these artists lost their livelihood. Mm -hmm. And I saw just a few that um, could actually make it in that kind of an art market. Uh, I was influenced, for example, by uh, Michael Coleman, who I used to do bronze casting for. Uh, mm -hmm. He's all, He's a very uh, well-known painter, but also uh, he, he I, I was one of his main uh, guys that did his bronze work for him. And he continued on and, and there was uh, lots of other wildlife artists I noticed were doing fine. They, they took a big hit like everyone else, but they survived. Wildlife was always something I was interested in as a, as a child, as well as uh, Native, Native American work. Uh, this is stuff I picked up from my grandfather. Um, that love of the outdoors and so forth. And so I thought, well, wildlife is, um, you know, that's the way I want to go. You know, uh, people always connect to animals. Every time somebody sees a wild animal, um, it's a spiritual and sacred experience for them. You know, if they, if they are out in the woods and they see a, a moose or a bear, boy, everyone point and, and make note of it, you know? So I thought, uh, in, in the uh, business of selling art, one thing that is very um, helpful is uh, the emotion that comes from nostalgia. Anytime you've had an experience with a with an animal, you'll you'll remember that experience. And and so I found that that always makes people happy. Mm -hmm. uh, it always made me happy as a kid. You know, my best friends were like horny toads and, and lizards, you know. <laughs> well, you know, Raymond, uh, when I when I review your work, because I have it up here on my other uh, computer, um, the fact that you capture the emotion of an animal that a, a human can relate to. Yeah, yeah. that that's really cool. What there's a, this little bear in uh in the Durango gallery called One of Those Days, and he just yeah. <laughs> flapped down. Uh and, and then um uh, the the rabbits uh and, and these are small pieces but they're beautiful uh ah that's the spot and the rabbit's scratching his ear you know yeah come and seen if you've ever been around a rabbit but just the okay. personality that you're deriving in there is is really wonderful well tell me leroy have you ever come home from a 12 13 hour day at work and the the first thing you want to do is just fall on your face 
Yeah. <laughs> Are you just so tired? That, that's where that, that the idea for one of those days came from. I just, you know, I've had so many of those days and it was a long, hard, you know, casting day or I found out that, uh, you know, something bad happened and I had to fix it. And it's just one of those days, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> it was really good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I really like this one called the fat and happy. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Is that a, a gopher or a beaver? It's actually, uh, actually, it's um, in the woodchuck family, uh, but it's actually literally a, a what's called a hoary marmot. And here in Utah, and any place that has alpine uh, type country, uh, you find these woodchuck type uh, uh, rodents. They're just fat, and they're just kind of doing their thing, and <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just. Happy go lucky, you know. There, there's a lot of emotions that people have in their life, and and uh, you know, I, I looked at that as a subject matter. And I thought, you know, what, why couldn't we all be just a little bit more like that, you know? Oh, for uh, sure, for sure. You know, we don't have to be uh, thin and beautiful. We can be fat and happy, you know. <laughs> right, for sure. And then uh, the, the this bear set, uh, the uh, better together. I, I, it's just all whimsical, but they're, they're real moments uh, that if you had the opportunity to see in uh, nature, these guys, you'd, you'd probably see that type of scene. Yeah. But it's kind of like they're wrestling or laying on each other. Something as a kid you can relate to, you know, with your siblings. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool stuff. I yeah. That, that, that piece is all about uh, that, that person in your life that you love and, and, and you'd be lost without them, you know, and you just, yeah. You're just better together with that person, you know. <laughs> I, I just think it's great stuff, great work. Thank and uh, in putting it all together, you know, the construct. Um, do you do you do uh, pre drawings before you sculpt, or do you just have an idea in your head and you go at it amorphically? Uh, I have never developed one way of doing things. I always approach things kind of from an engineering point of view, where whatever is needed, that's the that's the approach I take. Um, in, in a lot of cases where I have done a lot of commission work, it's necessary to provide some sort of two dimensional sketch. And that's very, that's where it's nice that I have that two dimensional background right. painting and drawing. Um, but when it's, when it's just me doing something for myself, uh, I can create something organically, make it, uh, as I go along, um, that, uh, better together. Mm -hmm. That was just. That was just an idea I had, and I just went with it. Yeah. Oh, nice. So it just it just came to you as you're um, building around with some clay. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then you've done some really like hardcore, uh, like Southwest scenes, like the buffaloes and the deer, mm -hmm. uh, the the buffalo um, uh, victory. Uh, very beautiful. Reminds me of a, a buffalo. Penny bird coin, you know, uh, it's really, really cool. Um, came up with that in the, in the grass, but yeah, when you're, when you're dealing with sculpture, um, you really have to have an engineering thought behind it, how the yeah. balance is going to happen, how, you know, how is it going to hold its form? And are you using uh, oil-based clay at this point? Is that what you're doing? I use both. The better together was done in a water base. Um, oil-based clay is, uh, most helpful when I know that I'm going to have to leave the work for a while. Um, I've got shows, I've got deliveries, I've got to visit the gallery, I've got to visit, you know, the, um, the foundry. And so um, I find that it's helpful, especially when I've got thin detail to just do it in oil based so that I can come back to it later and not worry about what's been broken off because it dried out too much. Yeah. Um, but uh, in that piece with uh, better together, it's such a, uh, um, mass that doesn't have a whole lot of parts that are sticking out too far. So it's really easy to just, you know, and it, and it was a whimsical quick piece. So I can do that in oil base or water-based clay. And I prefer water-based for a lot of different things. You know, you can get different textures that you don't normally get with the uh, you you oil. Lines. <laughs> yeah. And the oil base, it, it's hard to keep a line, uh, especially if your thumb gets in the way. But um <laughs> It, it, it's great. Now, let me t ask you this. Um, some of these pieces, do they come in monuments? So if people go to our gallery in Durango, they're going to see uh, medium tabletop pieces to small pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, like you have you have some bear scenes or some bears. Uh, do you do those in life, you know, monument size or? 
Yeah, in fact, last week I just delivered a life-size Kodiak uh, sized or like a big, big brown bear, like a coastal grizzly to a, uh, a high school, a private high school out in Maryland. Uh, so that, that thing was about eight and a half feet tall. Yeah. Um, and I've done larger, I've done things for, you know, big, big commissions and so forth. What I, what I will say to somebody is if you see something small, but it's not big enough for you, just let me know. I'll make it bigger. Yeah. You know, so. And so you're good, used to scaling. So, um, you're, you're not necessarily working from a maquette. You're, you're just going for the, the large format for the most part, right? I, I can, um, uh, there's there's times that I've uh, actually sculpted something very large without a maquette at all. And somebody has loved the large one, but they said, I can't afford that or it doesn't fit my <laughs> And you make it small. So I actually work backwards and make it uh, smaller from the yeah. from the life size. So in the old uh, days, they would do uh, grids, right? To yeah. Scale right. Scale up. Uh, and I, I think a lot of sculptors now are doing um, they get things sized up through foam. Uh, laser foam Dig digital print or yeah, yeah. digital uh, milling and so forth yeah yeah, yeah. so I, I i can see that but it seems like yours is more hands-on uh, well, I, I use whatever I, whatever tools are necessary for for uh, accomplishing exactly what the customer needs you know if they want it absolutely exact uh then then that's something where um, we could look at whether digital printing is the or digital milling is the best way to go, or or if they want a more organic, then I can do that too. Right, right. Well, we love having you in our gallery, and we're looking forward to you, uh, having you in our gallery for many years to come. Um, love the whimsical nature of what you captured. You you captured a lot of emotion in, in the animals that you studied and and sculpted. Um, like to uh, encourage everybody to follow us on our podcast on BlueRainGallery.com uh, under the menu bar for podcasts. Uh, you can also sign up on any of the platforms like Spotify or iTunes. I want to encourage everybody to come visit the Durango Gallery for Memorial Day. Uh, Raymond will be there doing a demonstration. We're looking forward to meeting him in person and, and hanging out with him. That'll be kind of a fun time. So... I'd like to also encourage everybody to uh, bring art into your everyday life by going to our online store, BlueRainPrintShop.com. Thanks, Raymond. Have a good day. Thank you, Leroy. Great talking to you. Yeah. yeah. Take care. <laughs>